Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon for those who are connecting from Europe, or something like it should be good night for because we already have a few colleagues from Japan and, and Asia, so that will be close to kind of even to midnight for, for those colleagues who are connecting from Asia. So I'm really happy that we are going to have our third webinar. Uh, it would be awesome to have people from, I mean, across the world. We, we start uh, people in, in Japan and then we come here in US. That would be something like early in the morning. So first of all, I would like to ask people to introduce themselves and give people an idea about what they are doing. And then you will start to go inside the agenda based on the plan that you already have. So uh, Akimasa, do, do you start? Uh, this is uh, Akimasa Hirata, a professor at Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan. Uh, my expertise is computational modeling uh, for electrostimulation. Thank you. Good, good. Really, really great to have you here. Okay. Uh, Yote. I cannot hear you. You need to, I think you need to turn on your mind. I cannot hear you guys. Huh? You have a mic option. You might probably need to turn on your mic. Okay, we, yeah, we, we can. We cannot. We cannot hear you. So let's let's move forward to to others who, who can introduce themselves. Ines, would you move move forward? Sure. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, cool. hi. Ines, I'm a lecturer on uh, neuroscience, and I'm interested in um, modulation of um, brain networks and how those impact behavior, so more cognitive applications of stimulation. Cool. Paola. Hi, I'm a professor of neuroscience, and I work, um, my, my lab is in Rome, but I work in Naples, my university is in Naples, and I'm very interested in using in, in the application of uh, TDCS uh, for cognitive rehabilitation. George. Hi. Uh, so my name is George uh, Almeida, and this is Lenya Emral. Uh, we are at the University of Coimbra, and our interest mainly lies in cognitive neuroscience, uh, essentially in funding how information is organized in the brain, and we use uh, um, neuromodulation to, to see how it works, so see how different areas are dependent on other areas. Maro. Hello. Hi. I'm Rome Fixen. Um, I'm interested in uh, different types of neuromodulation, but especially transcranial direct current stimulation. Uh, and how it, um, how imaging uh, EEG, fMRI might be leveraged uh, to get a mechanism. Cool. Tibor. We cannot hear you, Tibor. Yes, I was muted, sorry. So uh, I'm Tibor. Um, I am uh, in a new postdoc working on this uh, very cool project using <clears throat> real time fMRI and TACS and the brain optimization and i'm my expertise is uh, fmri mostly and real-time fmri in general i'm developing the open nft uh, co-developing the open nft toolbox and some other uh, tools to analyze i'm also into different uh, in international initiatives in open science like bit uh, or um, the uh, neuroimaging data modeling and uh, my uh, Scientific interest is in, in brain dynamics, uh, especially when related to memory and how to. Great. Ilka. Hi, I'm Ilka Laxo from Alta University, Finland, and I'm doing computational modeling of TDCS and TMS, maybe. Buddy. You cannot hear you, buddy. Hi, uh, 
Uh, I'm an experimental psychologist and a neuroscientist, currently a postdoc at the System Neuroscience and uh, Pain Lab in Stanford. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, mechanisms that underlie the experience expression and regulation of emotions uh, and emotional states such as anger and pain uh, and their uh, manifestation in health and illness. Jose, do you, do you have your mic back? Uh, hi. Yes. No, it's okay. Okay. So my name is Jose Gomez Tamez. Uh, now I'm working in Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan. And I will have a presentation at the end of the, this session. Good. Anand. Hi. Um, I'm postdoc in Harvard Medical School with Gottfried Schlaug. <laughs> We are trying to study effects of TDCS and trying to understand how TDCS uh, effects eventualize. And also we are starting a project with stroke uh, rehabilitation with TDCS, which is clinical trial. Duke. Hi, my name is Duke Shreen and I'm a research associate professor at the City University mm -hmm. of New York. Um, I'm an MR physicist by training, and so my um, ap approach is much more methodological, where I'm interested in using, using MRI to, to map out and measure the fields produced by TDCS in the brain, as well as developing um, more reliable, robust fMRI methods to, um, to measure the effects of TDCS concurrent with fMRI. Grazia. Hi, I'm Grazia Madeo. I'm a neurologist. I work for uh, Novella Fronda Foundation in Italy. Um, we are interested in the clinical efficacy of TMS in addiction. Good. So we already have few people that they have not turned on their camera. If there is any other person who wants to... And to... we are also interested in uh, finding uh, also of me. Chris. Yes, hi there. Um, I'm a psychiatrist in uh, Belgium and I'm mostly interested in uh, the working mechanisms of uh, non-invasive brain stimulation like TMS and TDCS and, um, and it's mostly in affective disorders and addictive disorders. Okay, cool. Okay. So anybody else? I mean, we already have a few others. Alexandros. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Alexandros Seftinos and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Johns Hopkins University working at Dr. Kirana Tsapkinis' lab and we're interested in the effects of TTCS in primary progressive aphasia. Cool. Any other who, want, who wants to introduce him or herself? Anybody who is on the phone who, is, who wants to introduce Asif. Awesome. Okay. Cannot hear you. Uh, hi. Me? Oh, hi. Uh, uh, I'm Asif. I'm Ifaro. I'm here, here with Fatima. She's colleague. Um, we're from the Lattice Institute uh, uh, in Dortmund, in the group of, of Michael Nietzsche. And um, um, yeah, we're also interested in the field. Uh, next year, we'll have our own MRI scanner here as well. So. Um, looking forward to a lot of different uh, uh, fMRI and TDCS what's going on. Too. Cool. Azole. I cannot hear you, Azole. Hello, everyone. Yes. Uh, my name is Aizara Soremani. I'm PhD candidate in uh, biomedical engineering at Anil Kabir University of Technology, Tehran Polytechnic, and I'm working on GDCS SMRI and Cool. Good. Anybody else in the in the room? Anybody else who would like to introduce himself? Okay, just just few housekeeping issues. Uh, during the talks, I would like to ask people to turn off their cameras 
and also turn off their mic because that would reduce the amount of kind of noise that we have inside the room. So just those who are going to kind of present it, I would like to ask them to to keep their cameras on. So for this part, we are going to have Duke, Ines, and George to kind of keep their, their camera on to, to be able to start a discussion. So the first part, we have we have started a discussion with Duke and, and Ines and George in terms of what are the items or, or measures we are expecting each concurrent TES fMRI should have as something like a quality control checklist. And we started a discussion to see what are the items that we can put together. And we have started to send few items uh, to others. And I think we have already sent something like 90 emails to different people who are in the network. So if you have not received the, the checklist so far, you probably need to send us an email and we will send you the, the checklist. The idea is to start it with, the, with the checklist, with just getting sure that people are happy with the checklist that we develop. And as soon as we get sure that, or, I mean, we already have all the items that we need in the checklist, we will move forward and we will ask people to sort of rate the, the, each item. So deciding about the importance of each item from zero to 10. And based on that, we will decide about the final item that would remain in the checklist. And then we will, decide, we will move forward and appraise all the published literature that we already have in field. So because we already have 53 concurrent TES fMRI published in the field. So we, we want to kind of get sure that you will be able to evaluate those 53 articles in the next step, and then we will get together and publish the checklist as something like a, a consensus in the INTF network. So I would like to start with, with Duke and ask Duke to kind of discuss about items that he has added as something like technical items to the, to the checklist. And I'm going to share, I can, uh, Duke, I can share the checklist in the screen or if you like, you can basically ch uh, share your your own screen. Which one do you which one do you prefer? No, no, it's okay. I think it's fine the way it is. Actually, I have it open on a separate computer, so it would be hard. Um, yeah. So, uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we, the, the items on the more techn technological factors and safety and noise, I suppose, they're um, things that have come out of earlier conversations and we've had separately and, and also in these webinars. And so I'll just walk through them uh, briefly. Uh, sort of, you know, there may be some differences depending on what type of, not just manufacturer, but what type of TDCS you're using, you know, the differences between high, high de uh, definition, uh, smaller electrodes versus, you know, uh, just the conventional two electrode large. Um, electrode. Um, I think one of the more important items on the technological factors is the issue with how you deal with the RF noise in the signal, in the fMRI signal, and I know that's something that came up multiple times, and, and, and many of us have um, learned the hard way how to alleviate that problem with different filters and, and you know, tricks going through the penetration panel versus going through the waveguide. And so I think that would really be a good contribution to have that so that uh, you know, people who are starting to do TDCS fMRI for the first time don't, you know, don't have to reinvent the wheel and go through those sort of hardships. So that's, that's one of the biggest, I think, um, uh, items on this, tech, on this checklist in terms of relevance or importance. And then some of the other items, you know, when we're doing TDCS outside of the scanner, often people will use saline solution and sponges. And, and that's something that is not as uh, I personally don't think that's what you should do in the scanner, and I think I'm not alone. So whether you're using, you know, 1020 conductive paste, I, some people are using Aberlite gel. That's another sort of technical issue. What effect that has on 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 the on on an experiment? Um, yeah, just going through here, and uh, some things that might seem trivial but could have a um, play in it in effect in terms of noise, especially if you're having RF issues, is the way that you route the cabling from the uh, point of contact on the person's head all the way back to the control room where you have the, um, the uh, neuromodulating machine. So these cables should you know, be straight and parallel to the bore. 
ideally it goes just straight to the control room. Some setups have them go through the back of the bore, but um, regardless, you know, the, this kind of, that configuration can help turn your um, cabling into a broadcast antenna, right? And so that would add noise to the to your acquisition. Um, just going over this list here. I think those are. So, I don't know, Hamid, did you want to go over the safety and noise tests, or do you want me to continue? That would be nice. Yeah, it would be nice if you discuss about noise and artifacts as well. So, unfortunately, I don't have a strong sense of, and I think it's because I don't think there's a lot in the literature that has sort of um, systematically looked at noise. Um, you, there have been uh, a few studies out there uh, that have either posted on their websites or included in their in their um, publications that measuring temperature, the effect of temperature under the electrodes and phantoms. Um, often the manufacturers will do this as a necessary step before um, you know commercializing their their equipment for safety reasons. Um, and then in terms of the actual you know RF noise, I I think that. That will be something that we will discover from the um, when we do the consensus paper and go through the literature to see who if is it anyone actually looking systematically at noise or are we all sort of you know it's the wild west we're, we're learning uh, from you know um, after the fact we see noisy data and we go back and try to find ways to alleviate it. Um, and then the other items there are just you know how we're doing the impedance testing and the electrical current tolerance, whether we wait until the person's in the scanner or we do it before they go in. I think those are all the items I have to add. Good, great. Ines and George, do you want to, to add anything to the, to the, kind of the discussion? Um, well, I think Duke nicely summarized the, uh, the checklist on the more um, sort of physics and technical challenge to have in terms of uh, what to think, uh, how to route the cables and the, the health sort of and safety checks. And what George and I focused um, way more is on trying to, if you could go down, Hamid, I think, on that list. So, yeah. So we try to think about more when you conducting um, a sort of behavioral task or your interest in a particular uh, condition, brain state, or thinking about what you're going to do. Um, and Hamed summarized really nicely some of the points that we have put in our initial iterations of the checklist. We had to do with, do you do concurrent um, TSS fMRI? Do you do pre and post? Uh, so the sort of um, brain state that you choose to target uh, in a nutshell. Um, on the second, uh, here will be point 13, is the type of design that you're using. Even if you, um, so if you have a task, uh, do you do this in a block design with blocks on and off? Um, do you also simulate doing a baseline condition? Uh, do you, the number of conditions that one thinks about simulating whether you do this um, again concurrent or not? and in a block or an event-related design. And the last point, um, Ahmed, if you could scroll down to 14. Go down. So everyone can see if you can go down, yeah? Because I think we have a point 14. You yeah, which that? has to do, again, uh, with sort of the timing of your stimulation, right? So whether your interest in, um, your more transition states, and if you want to have a better, um, a stronger uh, contrast within your task, so you probably go for short blocks where you can test different conditions, or if you have a particular task or rest condition that you want to target for a longer period of time. And then here, I think perhaps um, associated with this, but it's not a part of a checklist, is what sort of mechanisms one is modulating, which I think will be an interesting question to then discuss, but goes outside of the realms of a checklist, uh, I would say. Good, great. George, do you want to add anything to that? 
No, well, just that one of the things that we, since we're focusing is when we have concurrent uh, TDCS or, or neuromodulation on fMRI. Obviously, there are other things that are important for this, but are also important for using TDCS in general, like selection of, of stimulation areas, um, depending on what you want to do, and that's not really here. Other things that could be here are things like analysis. What kinds of analysis are more interesting given uh, given the, 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 what TDCS or, or TES uh, are. And I think that's something that eventually one could, could uh, go into, but again, this is not specific, I think, uh, exclusively, exclusively of um, the concurrent TDCS, uh, TMS, whatever it is, TDCS and TES and fMRI. Good, great. So uh, just kind of to, to, to kind of remind others about the checklist. The checklist is supposed to be about every methodological issues that would occur when we combine TES and fMRI. So we are not discussing about you know, technological or methodological things related to TES per se or fMRI. We are talking about things that are going to happen when we combine these things together. So we are talking about concurrent TES fMRI. And we want to add as much as detail as we can inside the, the, the checklist so if you like to add details in terms of different options that are available for each of these items. It would be really nice. So if you have a specific ideas about how to test noise, how to test artifact, how to com combine different kind of, uh, sort of task design and, and, and brain stimulation. So those ideas, it would be nice if we can add them to the checklist because other than using the checklist to evaluate what we already have as published material, I think that those checklists could be helpful for those who want to start and design a new study in the future. So they could help them to, to think about different potential options that they have for, for testing the device, to get sure that everything is working well, and also getting sure that they have, uh, they have a good idea about different methodological options that they have for combining these things together. So we like to add details. So we have already sent the initial draft of the checklist to the INTF members. So if you have not received the checklist so far, you are probably not in our email list. So please send us an email and then we will kind of figure it out how to kind of put you at, put you in the kind of uh, INTF checklist. And then we will move forward. So we have asked people to have one week of thinking about what are the items that they can add or what are the details they can add to the, to the checklist. Or they, they might suggest to, let's say, divide one item to two items because of different reasons. So we will try to finalize the, the items first. The next step, we will ask people to rate the importance of each item to be, uh, to, to be, to be reported in a study. And then we will evaluate all the studies, all the published studies that we have based on these kind of items. And then we will move forward from that top part towards to something like a kind of publishing the checklist as something like a INTF consensus about the concurrent ESFMR. So that will be the, the, the next step. And we have already started a discussion among few colleagues uh, about doing a similar thing for something like computational head modeling and, and TDS and kind of the, the potential the methodological details about that. So we'll kind of start a discussion inside the group probably as soon as we have a, a better idea about what could be the next step for, for that. So we really like to have these sorts of checklist, methodological checklists within the INTF network to be able to, to be used for, for future studies and also for future references in the, in the future kind of steps. So uh, we have just one minute left from, from this, this part. We have something like 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for discussion and question. But if there is a specific question about the checklist, we will be happy to take that question. Um, can I just add one thing, perhaps, is the, um, how about would checking you, or... It, would you turn on your, your, your camera when you're asking questions? That would be nice if you can, again, we can see you as well. Yeah, okay, sorry, yeah. yes. Um, so, it, again, it may, it may sound trivial, but I'm, it probably also worth adding to how to test or, or check or report the synchronization of communication between the stimulus, uh, the T, uh, TES device, the stimulus delivery PC, 
and and the scanner. So think about, for example, the, the scanner policies. You want to uh, uh, synchronize the acquisition and the stimulation with the data acquisition of the fMRI, and also if you control the um, the TES, TTCS, TACS device by script uh, concurrent with the stimulus. So you are, you are you are asking whether we are going to add that or not. We I so yes. What what do you think it should be also added or or this is something worth of considering? Course. If you I mean any any suggestion that could be related to the combination, we definitely would be happy to take the the suggestion. Then we share all the suggestions that we receive with others to have their ideas as well, and then we, we decide. I mean we try to kind of make the the initial draft of the items as comprehensive as possible, and then we will let others in the network to decide which item they have to keep in the final checklist or not, based on the ratings that we are going to receive from people. So that will be the process. So in the initial step, there would be something like an open door for any suggestion to be added to the checklist, and then we will decide based on the kind of the, the ratings that people would provide in terms of which, which one is going to remain and which one is going to be removed from the checklist. Cool. Okay, cool. So the next part, we are going to have a presentation from Michael Nietzsche's lab. Fatima and, and Asif are going to give us an idea about the, the systematic review on the parameter space and outcomes that we have. Heyman, Asif, and, uh, Asif and, uh, and Fatima are going to present. So yeah, we are, we are ready. OK, OK, great. Uh, let me just see how to share my screen. Just give you the screen. Just, just, uh, we are trying to share the screen. We have the screen. Just. Now you can share your screen. You're good to go. Yeah, yeah. can you see or? Okay. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone, everyone. So we are going to talk, talk about a study preview that we're working on, um, uh, on studies which use functional imaging and transcranial electrical stimulation. And as you can see, see it's been a group work, but, but uh, because of time limitation, only me and us are going to talk about it with us today. Um, okay. uh, I'm going to start by um, this question, this point, that why uh, such a systematic review is important. Um, as you probably know, the number of um, studies we have used transcranial electrical stimulation in different um, basic, uh, basic and clinical applications has been uh, largely increased during the last two decades. Um, um, but so it's really critical to, to, to get a comprehensive understanding of the underlying clinical mechanisms of, of TES actions. For sure, we have uh, um, animal studies, and also we have some we have some human studies which try to use to use invasive methods, methods such as transcranial stimulation and, and pharmacological mention to answer answer this. But the point is point is that uh, the findings from these from these humans are mostly uh, restricted to to the motor cord, and also are very um, like restricted to the two local regions of the brain brain. So. Um, when we can combine fMRI with TDS or in general around TES, it can uh, provide us with a picture picture of the whole brain and also the, the data that we can with this combination uh, can help us to uh, answer other questions. As well. So um, the point is that, is that when we look at uh, existing uh, T fMRI studies, is there is a large amount of variability in the parameter space that they use. So it's really difficult, really difficult to come uh, and, inter and integrate the findings studies and, and uh, do meta-analytic analysis. So in this systematic review, 
we um, we look at the structure of, ex of existing TMRI studies and the gap, the gap and we uh, consider yeah, the future yeah. works. So we have started by, by uh, preparing the database, looking into PubMed, PubMed based, uh, for, all, for all studies, publication up to, up to February 2019. And the key that they, um, they were, they were you, the keywords that were, were used were TS or TACS plus, uh, plus uh, one word for Mari. So but different population nations. Sorry, but there is a lot of echo. Uh, can you check what is there is a lot of echo. Hamid, uh, are you all hearing echo from? We have we have the same problem here as well. We have something like a it's not echo, it's just a problem in the in your 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 voice. Maybe I turn down the volume a little bit, maybe. Okay, now it's it matter a little bit. It's it's good. I think I I, I can understand it, but it, yeah, we, we had a kind of a minor issue with that. So let's let's move forward. Okay, so, so we um, looked into all possible combination of these keywords and starting from 493 uh, publication uh, at the first step. Uh, and often were removed because, as you, as you can see here, like they, they were either the review papers or book chapters or non-English ones. And then um, out of the 200, 254 remain, remaining ones, uh, by going, going through the full text of all these papers, then uh, some of them have to be removed, removed because, as you can see, they see they were either using only uh, uh, TDCS, only fMRI, or they were, use, they were using TES techniques, other things other than TACS. And finally, at the end, and in the final case, we have, have 108 TES fMRI. And uh, I need to mention that, and that it was a very demanding, demanding work going through all these face papers and uh, ex extracting all the meters that uh, we needed for next steps very, very carefully. And came on and uh, with, uh, with the help of friend, did, did, did a really good doing this work. Uh, so in the final database, we categorized all the TFMRIs into three group groups. Uh, you can see mechanistic studies, prevention studies, and montage studies. And the, the, uh, this division was based on the role of fMRI. In mechanistic studies, they use F fMRI to investigate the mechanism of uh, TES. And in prediction studies, uh, FM, uh, like baseline fMRI measures are used to predict the neural or behavioral response to TES, or uh, some uh, biomarkers are used to predict the response to TES. And finally, in montage studies, fMRI is used to measure and localize the areas in the brain which uh, are activated in response to, to a special cognitive function of interest. interest. Um, TES is, used, uh, is being used to uh, uh, target this, to investigate the, create the causal role of uh, these region, regions in the cognitive function. Uh, about me the methodological parameter space, just space, just to uh, assume, uh, uh, assume uh, it's like like really big. Uh, here is at least some of the parameters that can, that can be, like we need to consider consider when we are design uh, a, a fMRI study. For example, fMRI timing, um, the mass of fMRI MRI can be performed before, during, or after the patient, or a combination combination of this time we use. Or when we the control condition of a study, it could be used. Uh, it could be a sham controlled, or we can use an active control. Or there are even some some studies which didn't even um, in, include any kind of control for for data. And so uh, now I is going to continue with the results of these uh, studies that we have had in our database. Thanks, Fatma. Um, so basically, I'm just going to summarize what we found uh, so far from looking at, at the database. Um, so as Fatma mentioned, we tried to categorize the studies into three. Uh, the first were prediction studies, then we looked at montage studies, and then finally we looked at mechanistic studies. So by prediction studies, what we mean is that um, we want to see if we can use fMRI as a kind of predictor to inform our montages for doing stimulation. Uh, 
So uh, we can have two scenarios. We can have one scenario where fMRI is used as a predictor. Uh, uh, so you do emulation beforehand, beforehand um, try to localize this, which region involved, uh, uh, which might be um, might be better for improving improving the effects of brain station. Then, then you apply uh, and then you, and then you look again at behavior or the neural neural response to see uh, whether there, there was any improvement. Uh, then, then you can have fMRI as a response where where you look at uh, different predictor it could be informed by by either electric fueling. Um, Previous studies like uh, co covariate analysis on inter-individual variability, for example, then you, then you do uh, stimulation again, and then you want to want to see um, whether those, those predictors actually influence the effect of stimulation. We also have Montes studies. Um, these are studies which uh, look to see whether we use fMRI to improve our um, electric field. Um, that could be induced by TDCS, so basically improving our montages that we use outside of the classic, um, you know, uh, studies that have been done beforehand. So there are studies that looked at um, localizing the effect of um, different different tasks uh, on the region. So, for example, you could do a task where you uh, look at competitive task, and then you find exactly which area which area is involved in the. The electro electrodes are placed um, over those regions, regions, and then see whether there was a kind of uh, causal influence. Influence your uh, more, uh, more specific, more specific montage, montage, basically. Then we then we also have mechanisms. Um, here it's a bit it's a bit more uh, broad uh, because uh, we have we have to consider a lot of different parameters when we think mystic study. So, so uh, basically, studies that that want to understand what are the basic the basic effects of brain lesion on the brain. Uh, these can be influenced influenced uh, a lot by the different the different parameters. So, like uh, like we, like we mentioned, the timing of uh, fMRI with respect to stimulation stimulation can have an influence. Um, um, so we had to rise all of these studies studies separately. Uh, the design of this the study, whether you're in open label design, and parallel design, sober design, uh, that can influence the, the uh, outcome. Control condition is an important measure. Uh, whether you included a control, you had an act control, sham control, what was the exact uh, timing of your sham condition. Um, and then you also have to consider the sessions that you used, what was a single session or multiple repeated sessions. Uh, also with the follow-up of the fMRI imaging, so if you also continued fMRI in the follow-up. Uh, then you also have, have stimulation parameters to consider, uh, the shape of the stimulation electrodes, uh, intensity is a huge uh, variability factor. Um, you have have difference in stimulation intensities, with which you cannot uh, necessarily compare. Uh, duration of the stimulation again. Also, you have uh, a lot of heterogeneity there. Then, then you have different imaging protocol. So looked at both uh, sequence imaging, ASL uh, combination of both and ASL ASL. Also, like the, the actual paradigm or fMRI. Okay. Whether it was design, task-based design, design combination of both, um, and then uh, finally, uh, finally, we end up uh, quite a different, a different uh, heavy of study. So we have we have about 40 weeks that look purely, purely at logical effects, basic, basic using rest fMRI. Then there were that did both, both uh, rest and task-based study studies, 53, and then uh, uh, we had some study looked at the, the physiological effects, uh, and then tried and then tried to correlate them with the real effects. So those are the two studies at the end. At the end. Um, so just kind of give you a flavor of what we found. Um, we found a total of, of uh, out of all studies, we had mo most of the studies target either the, pre the prefrontal region, 39% uh, sensory motor region, which is about 34%, and then uh, parietal region was the third, uh, about 15 15%. And then of course we had other regions, the, the occipital, cerebral, temporal regions that were also targeted. Um, then we try to see like, like what kind of montages are being used out there. Uh, so for the sensory motor motor uh, target, uh, most of the studies have done the classic, you know, uh, M1, uh, FP2 contralateral orbit uh, mont uh, montage. We also have some studies studies that are doing bilateral uh, motor, cor motor cortex C40, uh, and then you also, then you also have some other montages, montages uh, in the sensory motor region. Motor region. So uh, using the right shoulder shoulder as a axillary electrode um, or the left. Uh, prefrontal things get, things get a little bit more variable. So, so you have different studies here. Here, um, most of the mont montages seem to be uh, uh, contralateral uh, left DLP PFC with FP, and then, and then uh, this followed by the bilateral lateral uh, prefrontal. 
uh, right and right and left DLPS. But outside of those two, you have a lot of different modules, like um, looking at CZ as a kind of reference area, and, and then uh, looking at more specific, specific regions in the prefrontal cortex, like, like uh, through medial prefrontal or ventral prefrontal cortex. So we can see that there's quite a lot of differences in, in modules, which make it a little bit difficult to, to uh, combine studies. I also wanted to just see uh, how precise are stimulation uh, montages with respect to the affected area. So here, here is a kind of a scatter plot. On the x-axis, you have the target area. So this is the region that the investigators wanted to target in their paper. And then on the y-axis are the reported areas that were affected. And so the di diagonal will basically be like a one-to-one -one of the target area influence the affected area. And uh, the main take-home message, message here is that uh, you see in the prefrontal, prefrontal uh, where the prefrontal region was targeted, you had uh, areas that were affected. Uh, cortex. So you had you had of course two areas that was affected, affected, but you included a lot of subcortical regions, regions, um, parietal regions that were affected, uh, to show that the pre the prefrontal region is like a nice hub hub for uh, seeing outside regions. Um, and then the sensory motor region, the region seem kind of pretty pretty uh, constricted with it with respect to the area you had about about uh, most of the studies uh, reported the, the sensory motor region. Finally, finally, we wanted to just uh, whether we could find we could find even two or three studies studies that had the same exact stimula stimulation parameter, same exact uh, study design. Um, whether it could be possible to com combine the two studies. So we started started first by looking at all of the mechanistic studies and we have on the sensory motor region. Uh, so this was 38 out of the 83. Then from those uh, 38 study studies, we looked at um, what kind of designs were used. So we had 18 that had task-based design, a uh, few that had a resting state design. Um, from the task-based studies, we had just two studies that did reaction time tasks. But all of, all of the other studies had various different uh, behavioral tests that could not be recombined. Uh, from those two studies, we had basically two different studies in the stimulation uh, intensity. So that, again, that was not combinable. Then we looked at the resting state uh, studies. So from those 15 studies, we had eight studies that had the classic uh, C3 and P2 montage. Um, other seven studies had different uh, various montages. Uh, from those eight studies, we had, we had uh, differences then in, then in stimulation during uh, 1.4.4 minutes, 20 minutes duration, 15 minutes duration, and then the most common seemed to be the 10 minute duration. Uh, uh, five studies there, there. Then we took five studies, and then we, then we found that again differences in how how the theater is positioned. The electrode. Um, so people so people used either 20 system uh, uh, or they used they used physio based uh, position positioning. So using mass two. Uh, position yield. Then, then again, there were also in the analysis met this method in the resting. So people, people used uh, gravity radical based analysis, analysis some others U based analysis, and, and uh, two these used ICA. Again, it was quite difficult difficult to find uh, matching gene uh, in all of these studies. Well, what is the conclusion here? We find that uh, the major concern, major concern is that there are a lot of studies, but there are not a lot of methodological homogeneity. So, um, for example, not a lot of the standard sham protocols uh, reporting a consistent fade fade out time. Uh, precision of how the electrodes are positioned is quite variable. Other uh, gel or cell or saline used, uh, we find that most of the studies have used saline. And uh, as Duke reported, this is not quite ideal because um, um, on something that's going, that's going to stay inside the scanner and uh, uh, simply tricky. Uh, and another thing is the left or the right hand. And so not not a lot of study looked at this parameter parameter whether it actually influenced the efficiency effect of teeth. Uh, and uh, and so uh, like we like we mentioned already, recommendation um, uh, list that acted. Uh, um, so then we support having having a full reporting of the methodological parameter parameters, including. Uh, stimula stimulation parameters, road shape, location, location, and duration. Also, condition is an important parameter, um, and this should be also inc included in uh, space studies to uh, really be sure that what we're what we're reporting um, with with uh, duration is not it's not just related to that specific task task, but also if it relates to other other uh, tests as well. So uh, we recommend uh, people to go to also do different control conditions. Uh, and then another condition, another concern, uh, pre-post versus simple pre-design or post-design. 
So we recommend having a pre and post design uh, if available. For. And ideally, we should uh, see if we can keep the uh, subject staying inside the scanner uh, just to reduce variability um, that can happen by differences in head position. Um, so uh, also, we should uh, recommend more and more people to do some more systematic studies to see uh, whether there are also differences in the choice of stimulation parameters, so stimulation intensity or duration, for example. Um, thank you. Also, that's all. Thank you, and uh, I give it back to Hamid. And if there is any question, any questions, we'll be happy. Thank you, thank you, Asif and Fatima. Really, really nice presentation. It shows how it's important for us to uh, try to harmonize what is happening in the field. Otherwise, it would be really hard to basically do any sort of analysis or sharing any data in the next steps. Good. Let's move forward for the next presentation for the sake of time. Uh, George, are you ready? So I'm going to make you presenter so you can share your screen. Sure. Sure. Uh, there you go. Can you see the? Yes, cool. But we, we cannot see the, your. We can see your screen. We cannot see your camera. But it's good if you want I'm to sure. go. It's fine. I just said it off. Okay, there you go. Cool. And I imagine you can see my presentation now. And George, you just have eight minutes, so kind of try no, to be no. good. I'll try to be as fast as possible. Um, okay, so let me see. Okay, so, well, let me just start by saying that, um, well, thank, I thank Hamid, obviously, but say that this is a off, an offline um, study. So essentially we, we do TDCS, uh, right outside the scanner, we get in, and so uh, perhaps this is not in keeping with uh, with some of the things that we've been discussing here. Also, let me say that this is in general about how areas uh, locally um, represent information, and now they can be that rep those representations, the organization of those representations, can be defined distally. This is what I'm interested in, but I think there are, there are topics here that are important for the rest of you. Um, so, in general, let me just go through this very, very quickly. Uh, how are representations within a particular area defined or modulated? Typically, we know that we have bottom-up stuff, so stuff, if it's a visual area, a lot of visual input from early visual areas. Uh, we also have top-down information, attentional tuning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that there's other stuff that we care about that is important for how things are represented in particular areas. And essentially, the idea is that representations are forged by how information is integrated within a network. And so object, object representations at a particular region should be malleable enough to inputs from other areas. And this is what we're testing. Essentially, what we're going to be testing is uh, whether if I take a node from one network, and this is a network that is responds preferentially, for instance, for manipulable objects, and if I take a network, say, the inferior parietal lobule on the left, uh, this, area, oh, sorry, this area here, sorry, this area here, if I stimulate that area, will I see effects elsewhere? Will I change uh, pattern discriminability and pattern similarity, given that I'm, that I'm using, uh, in this case, PDCS, a node on the photo, within this region? And that's what I'm going to be showing here. Um, uh, so modulating the FIPL, which is a node in the tool network, should lead to effects at the information integration representation in regions that are also part of the tool network. And specifically here, I'm going to show in a, a temporal, ventral temporal area, the left middle piece of areas that cares more about tools than other categories. And that effect should be specific for this region and for tools, but should not be observed or present for neighboring or in neighboring regions, also of the ventral temporal cortex, such as the FFA, the left FFA, the left uh, fusiform face area, an area that cares about faces above other categories. Um, and so, just to go through the design, this is a, a, a within subject design. Each subject goes through four sessions. A control, a control session uh, where there's no TDCS, it's just an fMRI session, and then. And that's always the first session. Then three TDCS sessions that are randomly distributed depending on the subjects, where we have a nodal uh, uh, in IPL, cathode in IPL, and cathode in another region uh, that is not a tool uh, region. And in fact, I'm not going to talk about that in the main part 
but but we use that for another uh, another study. Um, the, there's a bunch of it's a, it's a blocked experiment, so we present different categories in blocks. The parameters of TDCS are written there, so it's a two million pair, twenty minute. The reference is in the contralateral deltoid, so it's it's extracephalic. We're using a saline solution, so this is with uh, with with, uh, with enemy the sponge. Uh, the selection is based on the 1020 system, although we've also used neural navigation for some of the subjects. And we're then going to analyze our data in a um, ROI type analysis. And the analysis we're going to be doing are not are, are not univariate; they're multivariate. So we're looking at things like, um, I guess I don't know if you guys know this technique very well, but the representation similarity analysis, where we essentially look at the similar the pattern similarity across the voxels within an ROI for different conditions. So compare a tool with a tool, see how similar these patterns are, and compare a tool with a different face and see how similar these patterns are. And the question is, uh, here is a dissimilarity, uh, um, oops, sorry. It's a dissimilarity matrix. And so uh, cold colors are more similar uh, trials, if you will, objects, and warm colors are more dissimilar. And the question that we're doing is, in this part, in this analysis, is looking at whether similarity between, or sorry, within categories changed by, by the polarity of TDCS. And what we did in this analysis, as I said, is look at this, and what we show is that there, there's actually an effect of TDCS on pattern similarity, such that there's more similarity in the anodal condition uh, when we simulate IPL and we look at data coming from ventral temporal cortex, in this specific case, this left medial physical gyrus, there's an effect of TDCS on pattern similarity. So there's more similarity within tools in the anodal condition than the cathodal condition. And there's no effect on uh, within faces. So face patterns do not suffer from um, whatever is happening in IPL in terms of uh, stimulation. And when you look at FFA, so a neighboring region in the ventral temporal cortex, we see no pattern difference um, for either for tools or for faces. We also looked at pattern discriminability, and this is essentially a support factor machine classification. So if we train classifiers on the control condition, so the no TVCS condition, to classify between tools and faces, for instance, using either data from uh, the tool area in the ventral stream or the tool or the face area in the ventral stream, and then we test this, uh, this classifier with either data from the anodal or cathodal sessions, what we want to know is whether uh, classification is affected by classification in the ventral stream, and in particular in the tool area, is affected by IPL stimulation. Okay. And what we show, uh, again, just to show that the training set is in the control data, the test set is either anodal or cathodal. And then we can compare these two, and what we show is that uh, there is actually an effect on pattern discriminability in the left middle physical gyrus where patterns, tool, uh, tool patterns and face patterns are more discriminable under the anodal than under the cathodal condition. This in the tool area, right? When we, again, we're stimulating IPL, so we're stimulating the parietal cortex, cortical area. Uh, and that's not true when we look at the pattern discriminability in the left FFA. Okay, so this is the data that I'm gonna show you. We also look uh, so essentially, perturbing the left IPL uh, does affect integration, information integration, and discriminability, uh, or representation, if you will, in distal regions, in a very region-specific manner. Uh, so it's only an, uh, an area that is also in the tool network, um, and not an area that's very close by, but it's not in the tool network. And in a category-specific manner, it's just saying that it's, it's about tools and not about, so it's about the processes that are, process, that are done under uh, in the IPL and not any kind of process. Um, this is what I just said, so let me just go through. Um, and this is just in ventral temp two areas in ventral temporal cortex, and you might ask what happens on the on the on the other uh, regions that might be interested in tools. So I'm not going to talk about this study. This uh, perhaps Michaela, she's not here today, but she attends this meeting too. And we have a paper out also that shows that uh, using graph analysis uh, that the full tool network is changed in a polarity specific way. Um, but for instance, when we look at stimulation to STS, which is, an, which is not a tool area, we do not see 
any modulation. In fact, SDS or no simulation is exactly the same. It's the same effect on the tool network. Um, so, you know, this has conclude this has important implications for my area of research, but I think it also has implications for th this, uh, this um, group and mainly on um, local networks that are actually perturbed by distal stimulation. So when we think about an area, we have to be careful because it's not only local, it actually affects uh, stuff distally in a particularly defined way, in a content-defined way. And this is true of offline PDCS, but I'm, I'm almost sure it should be also true of online PDCS. Um, and this affects polar polarity of stimulation. I think it's important. Um, they are highly regional specific and functional specific. Um, and I think the fact that there are, there are neighboring regions here and one shows an effect and the other doesn't uh, also tells us that this is really about connectivity within the brain and how uh, our stimulation is passed along um, um, brain, connect, brain connections and, and, and important networks. And that's it. I want to thank my, my people that have worked on this, uh, on this data. Um, and if you have questions, please let me know. Um, we can obviously discuss this. Thank you very much. Have any sure. Really, really nice presentation. So the next speaker would be because would be Gadi. So uh, Gadi, I'm just going to make you presenter so you have and share your screen right now. Good. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Great. So uh, hi all, and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to share with you some of my work. Uh, this study was actually done while I was at the Tel Aviv Center for Brain Function. And I'll give you a little bit of background about um, anger, some context background, and then focus on this study that we used uh, simultaneous TDCS and the fMRI. Um, so, um, oops. So anger um, is an extremely powerful emotional experience. It is said that it can literally make us mad. Um, and if we succumb to its power, it can lead to all sorts of negative implications on health, well-being, our social environment. Uh, for example, the arousing component of anger is a risk factor for virus cardiovascular diseases. Uh, anger is also a major precursor to aggression and violence. Um, but some of the uh, difficulties in studying anger has been um, uh, classically associated with a difficulty in uh, gen generating a genuine experience of anger within uh, the laboratory setting. So as a first step, explaining our experimental paradigm, we uh, use the class so classical social decision-making paradigm called the ultimatum game, uh, stemming from behavioral economics. This is a sort of a monetary version of the prisoner dilemma. Um, when a player offers uh, um, how to split a sum of money to another person. Uh, when this offer is unfair, this generates negative emotional experiences, specifically anger, and is commonly associated with uh, an aggressive rejection of this offer. So the players do not gain any monetary reward because of this uh, sort of spiteful punishment in view of the breach of uh, social norm of fairness. Um, while this uh, is a very strongly uh, replicated and reliable paradigm, used for now four decades. Um, from an anger perspective, it's still missing both a uh, stronger sort of interpersonal context as well as additional appraisals that are important for this experience. So not only on looking at um, or focusing on fairness, but also on uh, uh, criticisms and threats and personal insults. And so uh, we developed um, a new uh, version uh, where we added to these uh, unfair offers some interpersonal messages, provocations, uh, trying to uh, tap into these additional um, appraisals, uh, stuff like, come on, you loser, or don't be a dirty pig, and stuff like that. And uh, what we generally found was that this uh, newer version that I call the anger-infused ultimatum game um, has significantly better psychometric properties to use and to assess uh, uh, anger experience and expression within the laboratory. In, uh, in a first study, we used this um, paradigm to uh, better, to try to understand a little bit more about the uh, neural underpinnings of anger experience. And this is an illustration of the key finding, which showed two uh, main brain regions through a whole brain um, 
analysis of fMRI data. Um, the first region in blue, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, was positively associated with a behavioral tendency to overcome the anger and aggressive inclinations and associated with more uh, money gained throughout the task or accepting more of these offers. Uh, and the reverse for a region in the brainstem overlapping with the, the locus ceruleus, um, which had a, a negative relationship, so more activation in this region associated with uh, more aggressive rejections. Uh, importantly, we showed that um, the activation, the VMPFC, um, also associated with the subjective emotional experience uh, through mediation models, showing that it could potentially um, attenuate or modulate the emotional experience en route to increased uh, uh, positive uh, uh, monetary rewards. So a potential mechanisms for uh, foreign anger regulation. Um, now, uh, we first wanted to understand if this might have some clinical relevance and due to time constraints, maybe it's better I don't go into all the details, but in this study, we were able to show that VMPFC activity uh, during anger provocation was able to uh, predict traumatic stress symptoms in a, in a court of uh, soldiers going to the military and experiencing chronic stress. More VMPFC activity associated with uh, less symptoms, so potentially buffering the effects of chronic stress. And and we also noticed that change in locus ceruleus activity uh, during anger provocation um, correlated uh, positively with these symptoms. So potentially both uh, a cause and a consequence of combat training um, and, and, and the supporting or evidencing potential clinical relevance. The key question that we had though was, is VMPFC causally involved in uh, regulating interpersonal anger? Or in other words, if we're able to uh, enhance Enhance VMPFC activity, will we also see downstream effects at decreasing anger and aggression? So, uh, luckily enough, I don't need to explain anything about what is TDCS to you guys and focusing on the design. We use the Neurocon MR system, uh, 5 by 7 electrodes, 1.5 MA for as much as we could, which is 22.5 uh, minutes. We had 25 healthy participants in a crossover sham controlled double blind design. So, participants came in for two sessions about a week apart, we counterbalanced the order of whether they first had sham or active stimulation, uh, which basically the, the ramp up and down was what differentiated between them. In the sham control, in both of them, there was a ramp up of uh, 30 seconds and the sham control, it immediately decreased afterwards, while in the active uh, task, uh, it, it ramped down back only at the end. Uh, you can see also the our montage based on both other stimulation studies as well as our own previous study in the lab uh, showing that if we place the anode uh, uh, just above the inion and between the eyes, uh, we are able to target the orbitofrontal ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, and we also place the cathode on the shoulder. Uh, might be less specific as far as how we are targeting the area, but we found many participants complaining about this uh, cathode on the um, sort of occipital part of, of the head, uh, adding pressure and discomfort during the scan. And it was a pretty long scan. We actually scan, we actually have scan, uh, resting state pre-post um, still being analyzed. So something to look for. And all this was done, of course, simultaneously with fMRI inside the scanner. And while they prayed this uh, anger-infused ultimatum game task. So uh, we first hypothesized that active stimulation should uh, increase acceptance rates, basically decrease aggression. We saw this uh, significant interaction uh, indicating that uh, compared to sham stimulation in red, active stimulation in blue increased acceptance rates for these angering, angering unfair offers. Um, we then looked at the subjective experience, again, uh, hypothesizing active stimulation will decrease anger. Um, importantly, I think we show that we did not completely abolish the anger response, the subjective experience. There was a significant increase in both conditions uh, between before and after the tax uh, in the subjective reports of anger. However, as you can see again in blue, the active stimulation seems to have attenuated this response and there is uh, less anger uh, post-task 
uh, or post anger in the active compared to the sham stimulation conditions. We also made, measured other um, emotion categories and found no uh, no effects over there. Uh, and by the way, I should also mention that as far as sort of the counterbalancing of uh, uh, whether the order was first active or first sham, by and large, didn't have any uh, substantial effects on any of the results that I'm showing to you. And finally, um, we hypothesized and also found, as expected, that uh, VMPC, VMPFC was indeed targeted. So here we're looking at whole brain fMRI, uh, contrasting the active versus uh, sham stimulation condition during the processing of angering unfair offers. So this is actually before the actual decision. Um, and in orange is the, you know, the clusters that more activated following active stimulation. VMPFC was there. Um, interesting to know that there was a coupling uh, with a reverse effect here in the anterior single late cortex and in two clusters in the left insula, um, so potential downstream effects of uh, VMPFC stimulation. Uh, now, this uh, result uh, was consistent only for about 60% of the participants, and so there's still a lot of margins to uh, improve. Um, also, unfortunately, we did not find direct relationship between uh, the virus behavioral subjective reports and uh, fMRI. Um, however, in an exploratory analysis, we also showed that um, the, the difference in anger reported following the task between active and sham uh, correlated with an independent measure of the habitual tendency to use emotion regulation uh, strategies, specifically suppression and not with reappraisal. So still potentially associated with uh, regulation processes. Um, another, I think, important insight from this is that there's something that might make uh, certain people more susceptible to the effects of uh, stimulation. Now, this could be very context dependent. Um, but potentially could be more generalized and think something interesting to uh, to discover with uh, with the kind of studies that we do. Um, as a potential next step, uh, these are some hypotheses about how the brain processes anger, and uh, we submitted a grant to continue to use TBCS to tap to these various processes with uh, collaborators in Australia and uh, Italy, um, hoping for some positive uh, evaluations. Um, and uh, that's it. I'll thank all my uh, collaborators and contributors, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for for the nice presentation. So let me look for the, the next presentation. And I'm, I'm going to give you the, the screen, so you can share your screen. Okay, can can see my screen? Yes. Okay. And then we just have eight minutes for you to present. So. Yes, Hamid. Yes. Sure. <laughs> uh, Come on. Hi. Uh, thank you, Hamid, for the opportunity. Uh, today I'm going to talk about neural and behavioral effects of stimulation dose and montage. This project was supported by NIH grant and I just want to acknowledge that. So even Asif mentioned before about the dose effects and also Jorge mentioned about local and online TDCS effects. So we have done some of those studies. So. We'll talk about dose. We did study different dose levels in our in our experiment, and different dose levels were three dose levels that we studied, which was four milliampere, two milliampere, and 0.1 milliampere, which was sham in our case. And we did ten minutes of stimulation. Am I audible, Hamid? Hamid? Yes, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Clear, clear and loud. Good, that's good. Okay. So we did 10 minutes of stimulation. Which, and at the start, there was 30 second ramp up and 30 second ramp down at the end. So these were three dose levels. And we used two montages, unihemispheric montage and bihemispheric montage. In both the montages, anode was placed on C4. In unihemispheric montage, anode uh, cathode was placed on FP1. In case of bihemispheric, cathode was placed on C3. So in total, there were 
six sessions, three unihemispheric sessions and three bihemispheric sessions. So we wanted to study effects. Uh, and to study effects, we did concurrent TDCS fMRI experiments. So our TDCS fMRI experiments were done with, we did two kinds of recording. One is resting state arterial spin labeling, which allowed us to do blood flow, record blood flow changes. And the TR for ASL was nine seconds. And we also did bold recording with TR of 3.2 seconds. Each of the scan were 24 minutes long with 10 minutes of stimulation from six minutes to 16 minutes. And uh, today I'm just going to discuss the results of SPM second level analysis with ASL because of time constraint and not the connectivity analysis, which is common to resting state. So we used block design with on and off condition. So before stimulation, there were six minutes of scan and after stimulation, we have eight minutes. So we considered that as off and on on time as 10 minutes of on time. So our SPM analysis showed that if you look here, this is unihemispheric montage SPM analysis. You, you can see that from as we increase the dose levels, the extent of SPM activation increases. Um, especially in four milliampere, you, you can see it's much larger compared to two. And on the right, you see SIMNIPS simulations, which uh, where you see that field strength is more where the electrode was, anodal electrode was placed. And in case of four milliampere, the field strength is more, obviously it is more where electrode was placed, but also around the electrode, there is higher field strength. When we look at bihemispheric montage, and SPM activations. We again see that the SPM activations extend over the area as we increase the stimulation dose levels, but we also see some, some more uh, activations in network regions, especially in four milliampere, if you see that there is some activation in frontomesial region, which is, uh, which is something interesting. And this can be corroborated with the SIMNIPS simulations on the right side. But something more interesting over here with the, with the, apart from dose levels is montages. If we go back to unihemispheric, sorry, and come to bihemispheric, we can see that even in case of same dose levels, the extent of activation is more and also on the left side, we see some activations which where the cathodal electrode was placed. So these are some interesting results and we need to look more into it how and we are looking more into it. But this is something interesting that we have found in concurrent TDCS fMRI experiments. Apart from this, we also did some behavioral experiments to study dose and effects. And our behavioral experiment was finger sequence learning experiment where subjects were shown screen with a seven digit number. And that seven digit number, they were asked to repeat that seven digit number as many times as they could in 30 second period. They did that with five times with left hand and five times with right hand. This was followed by 10 minutes of stimulation and they again did the same task. We wanted to see how they fared after stimulation versus before stimulation. So we used a parameter where we could count the number of fingers, number of sequences they typed and divided by the time variable. And we, we checked how they fared. So these are the percentage changes from after stimulation versus before stimulation on, you can see left hand on left and right hand on right performance changes and unihemispheric on top and bihemispheric below. You can see across montages, we see dose as uh, there is improvement in performance with dose level. And we saw this in both hands. This was 
this is something interesting that we see with those but we are still looking into are there some other montage variables those are uh, there so i would like to conclude that uh, we see that finger sequence performance improved with increasing dose levels uh, higher dose was associated with stronger and more extensive regional cerebral blood flow which which we see with unihemispheric and bihemispheric both montages and the extent was much larger in case of 4 milliampere stimulation stimulation dose and electrode montage both have differential effects on regional cerebral blood flow this we saw when we look at same same dose levels in unihemispheric versus bihemispheric stimulation the extent was much larger in case of bihemispheric stimulation and we uh, this this is something very interesting that we have found and we hope to continue more collecting more data and get to some good results thank you thank you anat it was a really nice presentation really nice results it's, it was really great uh, we have a couple of minutes for few questions if there is any specific question from george gadi anand and asif and fatima please turn on your 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 video and ask the question and the speakers would it would be nice if you kind of turn on your your uh, video cameras uh, may i ask one question Yes, Chris. Go ahead. Um, just to be sure, um, you were able to provide four milliamperes in the scanner, or was yes. it outside the scanner? It was in the scanner. It was in the scanner while the fMRI recording was going on. And you could have the four milliamperes stable over all the time. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I, I followed the, the question, the, the last question. So I still interested in the, the for the four four million app. Uh, so is the subject can uh, okay for this very high uh, simulation? Because I used the, in my lab is the, the subject feel the very very hurt and very pain, especially in the scanner. So how how big of your also electrode? So what's so, the error? Uh, yeah, our electrodes were anode was four million or four centimeter diameter, mm -hmm. and cathode was five centimeter diameter. And so, and so how, what's the self report of the subject? Does it feel the hurt <laughs> or not feel anything? No, they they feel it, but they they it was not hurting like. We did two two four milliampere scans, so they came back for the second scan with four milliampere, and they were okay with it. So it okay. was, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes. Yeah, so tol. So Thank we you. have tolerability counts, and we will do the analysis with that as well, like how much tolerance was there. So we have zero to ten scale on which we ask subjects and. nobody reported 10 or nobody quit because of uh, high dose level any other question from the speakers okay good let's let's move forward for the next two talks that are going to be about computational head models and we are going to have two shining stars in the field one from finland and the other from japan who has done both of them have done really great jobs in the field of computational head models so we are really interested to have their talks and i was talking about what anand presented i was going to ask him in terms of if he tried to see if there is any relationship between the computational head model uh, the level of current in in, in the inter individual level and then if there is any relationship between the individualized computational head models and the results that you have in your your kind of spm or kind of your fmr analysis have have you so, tried to kind of include the computational head model in your 
kind of for more analysis or not. Or if you are interested to share your data with somebody like like Ilka, who would be able to kind of combine the the computational head models and your results to see if there is any kind of uh, relationship between inter-individual variation in in the current distribution and what you have in terms of the response. So we we did individual individual uh, simulations uh, with SIMNIPS head modeling, and it it was not it was not highly correlated with every subject, but uh, with when we do overall comparison, then it looks uh, comparable. But if you just look at individual uh, subject wise then it's it's hard to hard to compare but there was uh, there was uh, there was one particular subject about uh, who had abnormality and in in that case it it had better results comparability better comparability between head modeling and and the fmri results but i I'll share that later, maybe. Cool. Ilka, you have, you can, you can share your screen. You already have yes. the screen. Cool. Okay, so is it, can you see my screen now? Good. You're good to go. Okay, thank you. So, okay, so in this talk, I will give you um, a brief overview of our research studies on the computational modeling of TDCS. So in particular, we have been trying to find if there is any dose-response relationship in TDCS. So as you may know, when you apply TDCS from uh, to the scalp, it generates an electric field in the brain, and the electric field depends on the individual anatomy. So the actual stimulus that you apply to each subject depends on, on the uh, anatomy of that, that subject. So there's a lot of variability in the, in the electric fields, so uh, the stimuli. And on the other hand, the responses to TDCS for instance, in the, in the case of motor cortical TDCS, the response is, is the motor revoked potential amplitude. There is there is also a lot of variability, and we have been trying to find if these two are related. So, do the people with different electric fields respond differently to TDCS? So, in our first study, which was published earlier this year, we had this type of study design. It was a crossover double bind study with 28 subjects. And we applied the anodal TDCS over the right motor cortex. And from each of the 28 subjects, we generated individual head models, which were used for calculating the electric fields. And at the bottom, you can see the, the study uh, protocol. It was fairly standard TDCS protocol. So we measured the MAPs in the uh, APV muscle before and after giving 20 minutes of TDCS or sham stimulation. And uh, after this modeling and experiments, we got this type of data. So from each subject, we have the three-dimensional distribution of the electric field. And from each subject, we got the MEP amplitudes following uh, sham or real TDCS. And also, of course, the baseline MEP amplitudes. So here is a zoom in of the, the data for one subject. So we had the electric field distribution and then the responses to real TDCS and sham stimulation. Oops. So the, the study questions were, were that if there is a relationship between the electric field data and the MEP amplitude data. And if there is a relationship, in which brain regions are the electric field important? 
So the approach that we took was very data driven. And um, we started by registering the electric fields to a common common coordinates, uh, which is this is something that is very commonly done in functional imaging studies. And then, then we used um, a technique called projection on, on latent structures regression to explore if there is a connection between the electric fields and the MEP amplitudes. I won't go into the mathematical details here. So, so first we registered the electric fields to a common template. It was the MNI standard brain. And once we had registered the electric fields, we could do some new statistical methods for analyzing the electric fields. Simplest uh, things that you can do when you have to register the electric field data is to, for instance, calculate the average electric fields over all subjects, and we can also calculate the the standard deviation and and measures like that. So here, here you have the average magnitude over 28 subjects, and this is the on the right is the average normal component of the electric field over all subjects. And uh, after registering the electric fields, we then use the PLS regression to to explore the relationship between the electric field data and the MEP data. So the electric fields were the predictors and the dependent variables were the mean normalized MEPs. Yeah. And uh, the analysis showed that there was one predictively significant PLS component for real TDCS. So the electric fields had some predictive power for for predicting the changes in the MEP from the uh, changes in the MEP following following TDCS, and there were no uh, there was no predictive significance for sham MEPs, which is quite natural. And um, in addition to predictive significance, the PLS regression also gives you information about which variables are important. In this case, the variables are the electric fields in different brain regions. And, um, and this VIP, variable importance for the projection, tells which electric fields have a predicting importance if you want to predict the, the individual MEPs. And the results showed there were the highest uh, VIPs per pound in this region here, which is actually the hand knob region. And the, the location with the maximum VIP was very close to the TMS hotspot of the of the ABB muscle. So this uh, this result was entirely data driven. So the PLS regression didn't have any information which region is which, but it still gave us this result. So we we then further analyzed the results. I will just show the final result. So we used a linear mixed effect model where we used the electric field calculated at the, at the point with the maximum VIP. And, and the result is shown here. First of all, we uh, there was a significant increase in the MEP amplitude for both sham and real TDCS on average. This was quite, quite an, uh, unexpected because we didn't expect sham to have any effect. Uh, but then the effect of electric field is shown in this picture. Uh, it's the this is the it's the slope slope of these curves. So we noticed that there was some significant effect of the electric field on the MEP amplitudes. So subjects with higher electric fields showed a decrease in the MEP amplitude compared to sham or baseline. 
And in total, the uh, electric field explained about 35% of the variability in the MEP amplitudes. So the result was a little bit curious. We got the negative effect of electric field. Subsequent lower electric field showed, showed a higher increase in the MEP, and subsequent high electric fields showed a decrease in the MEPs. So we we started doing a next study, which is still work in progress, but I have some pilot results to show you. So the hypothesis that we had from the first study was that is that the electric field at the TMS hotspot hotspot is related to the uh, effects on the MEP. And in the new study, we, we will use a different set of TDCS parameters. So we will have the duration of stimulation and we will also use it on the left M1. And we will also use uh, different, two different, at least two different electric fields for each subject. And in the pilot study, we had two different electro, electrode location in, in each subject. And here is the study protocol. It was similar to the first study, except for the different duration of stimulation. And we used two different stimulating electrode locations for each subject. And here are the data from the second study. So in the pilot study, we have nine subjects. And each subject was stimulated two different electric field distributions. For instance, here is the data from one subject. You have two electric fields, and then you have two different responses. So here, seemingly, the second electrode location produced higher electric fields, and you can see that in this subject, the response was also facilitatory in the, with the higher electric field. And with the lower electric field, the, uh, the stimulation resulted in decreasing the MEPs. And then we, from each subject, we extracted the electric field at the TMS hotspot, which was projected to the, the cortex. And then we used the linear mixed effect model, similar to our first study. And we got results, which are shown here. So again, the slopes show the effect of the electric field. And curiously, the effect of the electric field seemed to be opposite to what we found in the first study. So when the electric field was, uh, when the electrodes were positioned so that the electric field was lower, we, we noticed a significant decrease in the MEPs. However, when the electrodes were, were moved so that the electric field at, at the hand knob increased, then, then the results showed an increase in the MEP amplitudes. And the, uh, and the results uh, and the effect of electric field seemed to persist up to 60 minutes after stimulation. And also the, the effect of the electric field seems to seem to be consistent also within individuals, not just between individuals. So curiously, we got different uh, direction of effect in two different experiments. And we believe that the reason for this is that in the first experiments, we used 20 minutes uh, stimulation with the duration of 20 minutes. And in the second experiments, we used stimulation duration of 10 minutes. And uh, actually, there are is some previous data, uh, for instance, from this study by Montesilva and co-workers uh, that showed that actually doubling the duration of stimulation can also reverse the effect. And we believe that what we found is, is a different manifestation of this effect. So, so let me conclude. So 
we found that the electric fields in the hand knob could predict part of the variability in the MEPs following motor cortical TDCS. And uh, also the effects of electric field seem to be non-linear with stimulation duration. And we are cur currently working on a new project where we will have more subjects and we will also use more electric fields per subject. Okay, so thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. It was a really nice presentation. We have a few minutes for a few questions, if there is any question among the audience. So please turn on your camera and, and ask your question. And before kind of having other other questions, uh, Ilka, if you want to make a sort of kind of, based on your experience, making a, a recommendation, how to do, um, not not only for kind of motor evoke potential, when we want to talk about things like kind of F combining fMRI and and computational head model, based on your experience, do you have any specific recommendation? For example, for for the presentation that Anant made, uh, how to kind of combine the computational head modeling and what he did in terms of the let's say the whole brain data analysis for let's say the uh, the uh, the uh, yeah, regional kind of kind of, kind of blast flow in the brain. Yes, but uh, I, yeah. So basically, the electric field data is also it's very similar to functional imaging data because it's also three dimensional, and I believe that. There are some methods that we could use for relating the electric fields at each location to the functional imaging data at each location. And so, so for instance, if we have some locations with high electric fields, do we also see uh, larger changes at those locations? And So basically, if you and electric field modeling is well, if you know how to do it, it's rather easy. But you have need to have the input data. So if you are going to do this kind of study, we would need to to have the well high quality structural MRI and then also uh, very good information about the locations of the electrodes so that you can pro model them properly. And once you have this information, then then modeling the electric field is just putting these values into the computer. Mm. Uh, do you have any question? So, uh, you mentioned about doing more experiments with, uh, and I think you mentioned about doing MEP recordings, right? Uh, but- uh, Yes. And I, I think you mentioned about some new study which you are planning to do earlier. Uh, but are you planning to do something with individual specific changing electric uh, input or not yet? Uh, not yet. So we are, as the response, we are going to use the MEPs for at the moment. But relating to electric fields with the functional imaging data would be really interesting to do. Good. Okay. Great. Uh, the next speaker would be Josef. Let me just kind of give you the, the screen. Okay, Josef. Can you hear me? Yes, you are. Okay. You can, you know, speak. Yeah, we can see your screen. Good. You're good to go. Okay. Okay. So well, my name is Jose Gomez Tamez. I'm working in Aguilla of Technology. And I would like to briefly talk about our recent 
studies or recent works related to TDCS. Um, so let me let me start. So in the in the previous uh, meeting, the, we have some interesting discussions. That some of them were related to the high levels or inter inter individual variability during TDCS and the need of a systematic evaluation. And how can we uh, consider these intersubject variability homogeneous populations, but also in heterogeneous populations? Uh, like, the, for example, some aging effects may have some effects on the CSS content or scale conductivity that may affect uh, the current distribution inside the brain. So in this, uh, in this work by Batilka, he investigated the inter variability in, in the in the in the cortical regions for cor cortical motor regions during TDCS, and he described uh, some relationships with uh, some anatomical uh, factors. Uh, recently, we have uh, extended uh, this this work to consider not only the cortical regions but also the deep regions. In this study, we also show some in, uh, high variability of the electric field for the cerebellum. And so, well, so the, the importance of uh, considering the intersubject variability is, uh, is significant uh, because uh, we can investigate these uh, group level electric fields like uh, previous presentation, uh, also to uh, study different population segments and also to have uh, validation with fMRI studies that will be some of the uh, maybe uh, important directions that we can consider uh, using electromagnetic computation. So in order to do this intersubject uh, analysis, we need to register the individualized electric fields to a standard brain template or also uh, deep brain regions. And this can be used to uh, also to investigate the, how to maximize the, the current distribution to specific regions or around uh, around some regions using for one for all montage, or on the other hand uh, to investigate the individualized uh, electric fields and how they can also be used to to uh, reduce the intersubject variability by specifying the, the dose, dosage in the brain. So here, just is uh, an example. In, in this study for the deep regions, we found that uh, intervariability is around 40%. And in this case, we show the standard, uh, stand, uh, yeah, standard variation. <clears throat> Uh, in this uh, in this figure for the cerebellum and also for uh, different uh, deep deep regions as well. Um, so here we can uh, re re have some relation. For example, what is the effect of the CSF uh, with the current density spread? Um, this may be interesting for studies uh, aging populations where the CSF content changes. And the uh, uh, activation, the the target region may be shifted from different positions. So, how to locate the electron montage for the different populations uh, might be an important uh, question or parameter that we can uh, analyze using these electromagnetic uh, approaches. So, for instance, uh, uh, usually for TDCS, the effect is usually investigated on the cortex, but however, this uh, dosage can also reach uh, deep regions uh, with comparable variables to the cortical regions. So, in this example, in the first, uh, for the C3 FP2 with a large electrode, we can find uh, regions like in the caudate where the electric field is uh, close to 80% uh, the electric field in the, in the brain cortex. So here we have a very significant values of uh, electric field in, in deep regions. Um, 
on the other hand, if you use uh, small electrodes or high definition, the the electric field in the deep regions will be lower than 40%. So this results that if we are using a large electrodes, this can have some um, uh, credence to the idea that TSCS options might reflect also uh, deep neural modulation. And these uh, side effects, if we want to in uh, this possible deep or distal neural modulation, uh, should be also considered during the design of the different experiments uh, when we are considering uh, different sizes of the electrodes. So this might be also interesting in the future to consider with the fMRI studies how the different uh, electrode sciences may activate, uh, may have some modulation effects in, in, in deep regions and the proportion of these uh, variations. Um, also, these uh, uh, group level electric fields can be used to optimize. Uh, here I'm showing uh, scout maps of the electric field uh, where the position, in, th in this case, is for the TMS localization, but the same can be applied for TDCS. So here the different positions, uh, the optimal uh, positions to activate the specific uh, deep regions may be obtained by these uh, atlas or uh, scout maps. And these ones uh, on the right side shows the uh, position that will be optimal to uh, to have the highest uh, electric fields in most of the deep regions. So this also may be interesting when there is no possibility to have or the access to have a navigation system to localize uh, uh, electrodes based on, on electromagnetic computation. We can also try to optimize the the those for for a, for a group of, of people, for a population. Okay, so uh, one of the bottlenecks to investigate further intervariability in different segments is the generation of uh, head models, uh, individualized head models. So in order to try to, to, to know what are the different effects in heterogeneous populations, uh, we need to reduce the the construction, the generation of these head models. So now, currently, maybe a semi-automatic cementation may take around eight hours. But now we have recently published a, a work by Isan Rashid as a first author, where uh, we investigate the deep learning, and we could reduce the generation of the head models to uh, 20, 20 seconds. So by using the deep convolution and neural network architecture, we could generate the uh, segmented models that can be used for electromagnetic studies based on the fMRI. So this is just an example where we show the, the true value for train and the proposed uh, network and uh, well, the matching you can see is uh, very, resembles very well. And uh, when we compare the dice coefficient to see what is the quality of the segmentation, we can find that most of the tissues are, has a dice coefficient over 90% for our our approach, which is the purple one. And so, yeah, so basically this is uh, the one of the, maybe the first study trying to, to uh, generate this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, head models based on the MRI data directly. And uh, we found some some validation using electromagnetics to see what is the difference of the electric field when we are using the true segmented head models with the uh, machine learning generated head models. And we found that the error is uh, is low, lower than 2%. And so this can be used for uh, try to investigate the large populations so as we can now generate the uh, many head models in a, in a very fast way. The other um, the, the other uh, way to reduce the computation of this is to have a real time estimation of electric fields uh, using a similar approach. The group from uh, also from the Agency of Technology, uh, Jokota, 
it was possible to to compute the electric field in real time. And this is similarly, we from the MRI data, we apply machine learning to obtain the electric field uh, directly. And also we have a very good uh, resource when we compare with the electromagnetic computation based on the volume conductor and the ones and the electric fields generated from the from the machine learning. We also have a very uh, good uh, agreement between the results. So this uh, these two methods can uh, reduce the this bottleneck. So uh, in the future we may have a, a big uh, data yeah, analysis. So this is maybe another uh, area where we can uh, have cooperation to try to understand what are the different effects on, on different populations based on electromagnetics analysis. And now another recent study that we have been working is imaging by multi-scale modeling. So the multi-scale approach is the realistic biophysical modeling of the electric field coupled to neuronal membranes models. This may offer a more detailed description of TMS induced effects. So we have uh, uh, we have done some uh, simulations where we obtain experimentally derived induced electric fields. This is based on tracking the the position of the this in this case is for TMS the position of the coil and the angle to see what is the activation of pyramidal tracks and uh, models embedded in the motor area as you can see in these in these figures. So what is the effect of the electric field on the on the neuronal activation? So here we present the data for eight subjects. Uh, the red uh, region presents the the hot spot when the uh, maximum stimulation output from the TMS device is uh, smaller to activate the uh, the neurons. At the same time, we compared with the concurrent super threshold TMS fMRI, and we found also a good agreement for the activation map based on the neural activation. The center of gravity activation map, as you can see in the bottom of the table, the error was around six. Uh, millimeters uh, for for activation map. In the case of the electric field, the error was around 10 millimeters for super threshold uh, TMS experiment. So this may open some uh, possibilities on, on another predictor that we can also consider uh, to investigate uh, the regions where the brain stimulation is targeting. And also some ways of how we can also combine this with fMRI for further validation of the models and also, also to provide some uh, estimations uh, before the experiment is uh, uh, during the, for the design of the experiment. And finally, also another important aspect is the uh, synaptic effects. Uh, there are a lot of discussions of the local, how the synaptic effects are acting on the brain circuits, local level, but also uh, distal effects, for instance, the spinal cord may have some influence. Uh, and this study is for uh, cortical stimulation. Uh, we we uh, propose a model to consider the distal effects of the synaptic at the spinal cord and we found we are, we are investigating the interaction of the frequency and also the number of pulses. So how this uh, interaction may uh, reduce the required stimulation threshold for, for generating a, a, a motor response. So these were also close to experiments uh, by other group on the monkey. So. This may be also another uh, area where we can explore uh, how these uh, uh, other effects are influencing the, the brain stimulation results. So just a final remarks. So, well, we, there's variability of around 40% in cortical and deep regions. Uh, 
personalized electric field as the presentation of ILCA. It uh, can be useful to understand or reduce intervariability. Uh, group level effects to investigate, for instance, distal effects of TDCS or optimization. And, and so also how to analyze homogeneous heterogeneous populations by proposing uh, machine learning techniques to improve the, the, to speed up the computations and reduce the bottleneck, especially during the generation of head models. Also, the other possibility to use mustl analysis to to also have additional predictors for to combine with fMRI results. So yeah, this is uh, thank you, thank you very much. Really nice you. presentation. Good, great. So I, I would like to ask others to touch turn on their cameras. So it would be nice to have all the, the all the cameras on, so we can have a kind of a final discussion and. Uh, you can turn off your screen. I mean, you, your screen share. Then we can have all the ca all the cameras being shared. So, so any question from Jose? So, uh, I'm asking. Would, would you just turn off your screen share? You 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 can't click on that and stop sharing the screen. Yes, coming. Hey. Can you see the webinar? Yeah, I was asked to watch that, so I'm watching. Okay, it's fine. I'm uh, watching, yeah. Anand, go go ahead. Um, Jose, you you mentioned uh, twenty seconds for. Generating a head model, and I'm like super interested in that and how uh, you achieved that. Which kind of software you use, and what what is the role of machine learning in in that in reducing that time bottleneck? Uh, yes. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, machine learning maybe the. The process of the learning is the ones that take time. So we have a training data using a true head model to generate the, the structure of the of the deep neural network. After the neural network is uh, is generated, we can just apply to input the MRI data, and the results becomes uh, very fast. Of course, uh, this also deep neural network we have applied for. Uh, data sets that are from different fMRI and the results seems to be also also good. So I think uh, uh, yeah, this approach may be very useful even for different uh, machines, MRI machines, etc. So if if I understand correctly from your presentation, you you said you use structural MRI data, right? And here you're when you're mentioning uh, neural network you're mentioning compute in in the sense of computer algorithmic neural network not the neural network simulations of actual neurons yeah yeah the, the yeah it's the right the first one that you mentioned yeah. okay okay good great so we have time for a few minutes for any specific question that people would like to ask from anybody in the network? So I think that we are realizing based on what we have been discussing today and during last two webinars, there are uh, at least three major fields for collaboration right now in the network. So first of all, we have started with discussing about technical details of doing concurrent TES fMRI. And it seems there are technical challenges for, for doing that. And people are really interested to see how it's going to be doable. And it was quite interesting for me as well that Anant was able to do a four milliamp simulation inside the scanner because we know that it, that is not something really easy. Those who are doing concurrent fMRI, TDCS, they know it's not really easy to do inside the scanner. There are definitely technical details about how to run uh, TES uh, kind of stimulation inside the scan. So that is one thing that we are right now working together with Duke and Ines and, and George and I mean others in the network 
trying to make a methodological checklist together. That is one one issue. The other issue, as uh, uh, Asif and, and Fatima, they, they mentioned beautifully in terms of how we might be able to share our data and our protocol in the future and how we might be able to harmonize the different protocols that people are doing because even with something like 120 papers in the field, we are not quite sure about what is the real mechanism of, of TDCS or TES using fMRI. So there are variations, how we might be able to share data, how we might be able to kind of put databases together and do uh, kind of larger data analysis. That is another issue that we really can kind of work together on that. And the third issue that we have been discussing today, we have been discussing about computational head modeling. And it seems that one of the, the challenges that we are going to sort of hopefully work together on that specific challenge is how to combine uh, fMRI results that basically there are 3D kind of whole brain results with the computational head model and how we might be able to predict how much of the variation that we have in terms of inter individual variations that we have in, in fMRI would be related to the uh, computational head modeling and the variations that the user was, was mentioning in terms of we have something like 40 percent variation in, in the level of current in, in different parts of the brain. So these are basically the major kind of technical challenges that we are we have been discussing today and I'm hopeful that we can do things together in terms of consensus papers, kind of methodological checklists and, and data sharing in the future. So following these kind of items, if there is any specific discussion or question that people like to ask inside the network, that would be nice to be to be kind of introduced or discussed. I, I have uh, one question uh, for the group. I'm wondering how people um, calculate uh, their sample sizes or fix their sample sizes for different studies. Um, it's a problem that we face quite often, particularly when trying to budget for these sort of studies that are expensive. So any insights that people have, maybe using computational head models, I guess, to assume some kind of variability or other approaches people take, I'd be really interested to hear about that. Any answer to that? Um, ben, I think sort of depending on what is your outcome variable, right? So I don't know if we've done hard calculations in the past based on uh, behavioral metrics. So it depends on what is your outcome variable. If it has to do with if it has to do with physiological change or it has to do with a behavioral change. So starting by narrowing that question, I think will help us mm. guide you. Sure, yes, it's certainly a very, very broad question. I appreciate that, absolutely. So I guess um, some of the approaches that might might work would be, as you say, using physiological data to try and power a combined um, MRI um, physiological data. Running pilot experiments, I guess, to see if you can generate a power calculation i mean is that the kind of process that the that people use in the field uh, i mean i guess that i consider quite a lot of we've done just pilot really we kind of um it, the sample size is governed by the the number of participants that we can recruit for the study and uh, constrained by the budget uh, did mm -hmm. are there any other techniques that people use um for specific questions i think sorry to interject again but i think um Ilka's presentation, Hose's presentation, make a really good point in terms of variability, which is something that we knew, right? So again, it depends, are you modeling for a group effect or are you changing, checking for a defect in, in the individual? And I think those sorts of questions we'll need to address more and more. So we know there's a big variability. And I think they've done a brilliant job in showing how variable this is actually is. So yeah i don't know ball again to you it, it, are we really thinking that we should be defining um the these our simulation uh parameters in a sort of one fits all approach which i don't think yeah uh, it will work so well if i can, can I add to something to oh sorry Oh, go ahead. Uh, or, or Iman, go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, the issue is that about the sample size that uh, we have the same problem in all the field. And uh, we are uh, trying to make, a, uh, we, have a, we have a draft in, in preparation now, how to uh, run a pilot study and then based on that to calculate your sample size. And the best approach in our field, since uh, most of the parameters that we are trying to find out are not well established, uh, the best approach is to run a very small pilot and then uh, take out the parameters and the variation and the difference of the variation would provide us the power sample size that we can go on to the whole study. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe in, in a month, uh, our paper will be on the table, then then you can find some more practical issue on that. Gladi, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I agree with what um, all of you have, have said. I just wanted to know that from uh, my experience in a couple of studies, at least within the realm of, let's say, cognitive and sort of affective paradigms, the effect sizes are pretty small. Um, not talking about the behavioral or you no know, those aspects, but within the brain itself, if we were looking at fMRIs as the bold signal as potential dependent variable, then the effect sizes are small. So I don't know, maybe this is also a question if others see the same thing, but since the, the effect sizes are so small, I would uh, sort of su support the general notion of just realizing how important it is to have a nicely sampled sort of a uh, group of participants to get there. Maybe Iman's uh, study will, will reflect that in some ways, but that, that's just what, what I found. Yeah, this is, this is exactly the, the main problem that uh, all of us have, uh, have that, and uh, the, small sum, uh, the small effect size, and uh, uh, sometimes the variation inside the sham stimulation is so high and the bioequivalency with the uh, functional activity is almost impossible to go after. For example, in one uh, in this study type that I'm mentioning, uh, if we go through the conventional study calculation, sample size calculation, we need more than 300, uh, 300 cases to go through that. But we launched a new method for adaptive type of the uh, adaptive type of the sample size calculation. So based on that and the seamless study type, we can decrease the sample size and, and updating it and dealing with the, uh, with the ethical committee more easier. And uh, no, no need for any amendment when we have some problem and we should be prepared. Uh, some of our hypothesis can be rejected very early uh, be because of the fertility and so on. Good. Any other specific question? We have just probably two minutes left. Any other question or thing that people like to, to share? So then we are thinking to kind of make something like a platform for those who are interested to kind of post a specific question within the network. We probably move forward for that and we try to keep in touch. So the, the, the next step would be trying to make those uh, checklists that we are trying to put together and we are looking forward to receive your comments and you'll move forward for the consensus paper about that checklist. And then we see how we can kind of move forward for the next step. So we, we are planning for the fourth webinar in January next year, almost in the same time, something like late January. And we uh, keep you posted about the exact timing and all other details after discussing about some of the kind of things that we are, we are putting together. So hopefully we will meet uh, next year in the, in late, uh, January. So looking forward to meeting you then. And we post the, uh, the video of this webinar online for those who are interested to see the video again. Have a nice day. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Is this finished?